Okay, so let's, we'll just wait till he signs on here, but I wanted to make a few remarks first. And one of them is, uh, I can't tell you how proud I am to be part of the ag industry and, and also commissioner at this time. With, with the challenges that we're faced with, the biggest challenges of our lifetimes on this coronavirus thing, it's, it's been remarkable to me how the ag and forestry industries have, have stepped up. You know, we're accustomed to challenges, we're accustomed to hardships, and this is like no other, but we've met that challenge. And, and I'm proud of what all of you have been doing to supply the, the food and the fiber and the fuel for, for the citizens of Tennessee and the world too, for that, for that matter. The uh, governor and the economic recovery group have been working hard on reopening, reopening the economy, uh, but it has occurred to me, you know, we have been, the ag and forestry industries have been uh, critical infrastructure from the start. And so we, although the lights may have been dimmed a little bit, we've been carrying on business uh, as usual. And that's been a good base and a good foundation for uh, for reopening the rest of the economy. And the lessons that we've learned along the way are, are, gonna, are gonna be very useful for us. So a shout out to all of you for what you've been doing. And I know it hasn't been easy, but uh, it's it hasn't been unrecognized. The, the props I have up here, um, the Tennessee Pledge that, that uh, we're using as the, is really the, the, the way we're gonna open up the economy is gonna be a pledge that we're gonna open up the economy safely and effectively. And the big part of that is what we've all, always known in, in agriculture is biosecurity. And biosecurity are preventative measures that we can take uh, to prevent and slow the spread of the coronavirus. So I know you're already accustomed to these, but we've got the, uh, the orange gloves, we have the hand sanitizer, and the one that's gonna be uh, our new normal is gonna be face coverings. So um, you're gonna see, I would invite you to go to uh, Tennessee.gov website and go to the Tennessee pledge section under COVID-19 and look at what, uh, study that and look at the basics of, of the foundations of that program as far as the, the guidelines and, and the biosecurity procedures. And you're gonna see a lot about these uh, three items here is, as well as uh, health questions and um, adaptations for each, each sector of business as they come aboard. So, um, so you've probably seen on the news, it's been on the national news the last three or four mornings that I've watched uh, uh, about the potential meat shortage, the announcement by some of the larger processors that uh, they're facing many challenges but based on absenteeism, on spikes of COVID-19 outbreaks in certain facilities. I think uh, I saw this morning that there's 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 12 or more major processors in the, in the country that, that are that are closed at this time. I know Secretary Purdue also announced that uh, many of those may come back aboard in production within the next few days. So maybe that uh, that challenge is going to be turned around. The president also issued an executive order um, ordering uh, uh, meat processors to stay open if they could. So, okay, so we do have a yeah a special guest, uh, Governor Bill Lee. Are you on? Oh. No. No. Okay. So when the governor pops on, we'll just stop where we are. So um, is the uh, the the speaker of the house, Cameron Sexton? Are you on? Yeah, I'm here, Commissioner. Yes, sir. How are you this morning? <clears throat> I'm doing well. How are y'all? Good. Thanks for joining us. So we had some interest on uh, uh, fr from the callers about what's going on uh, with the legislature, and we thought it'd be a great idea that if you could come on, and you are here, and so we appreciate that. So did you make some comments? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you, and, and thank you for everything uh, y'all have been doing uh, to help us in this situation to help our economy to get restarted back and 
um, you know, it, it takes everybody to do it. And so I very much appreciate everything that you all are doing. What I like to say, we've been talking to members and working with the Senate and the clerk and the administration on, on how we're going to uh, get back in session. Um, what I will say is, you know, as, as we've learned during this process, it's very fluid. So what, what is today may change on Monday. So, you know, all I can speak to is, is where we're at as of today. And as of today, our goal is to go back on Tuesday, the 26th and have committee meetings um, where we sent out a tentative schedule. Um, and so it'd be mostly all subcommittees that week with a few of the bigger committees that have a lot of bills, judicial, education, and state, um, and, and start having bills go through the system in anticipation of going back on June 1st uh, for the first day of session. Um, we're in conversations about, you know, what legislation and what, what that would look like. Um, so we're, we're kind of breaking out the bills based on what things may cost money and what things don't cost money and what things save money and, and starting to have the conversations with our committee people and having them start looking um, through that process. We, we started talking with the administration on, uh, on their legislative package and they're starting to decide on, on I think, what directions they want to go on, on their bills. So we're hopeful at this point that we'll be back the, the last week of May and then probably be there for a couple of weeks, um, at least through June 15th or some a few days after that, because that's when the next revenue report comes out with hard data uh, for May. And so we need those numbers. As far as the budget goes, the, the budget is going to be very tough. We're going to have to cut. Um, there's wide ranging numbers out there until we get more data, but it's going to be very significant cuts for this year and for the following budget year. So uh, there'll be some very tough decisions that have to be made uh, on that as well. Um, finally, as, as we are thinking about opening up, uh, the House side is planning on opening. I can't speak for the Senate, but I'll leave that to the Lieutenant Governor. On the House side, we plan on if we're coming back to do committees and have a session, then we we plan on having it open to the public, which means if liaisons want to be there, if lobbyists want to be there, if the public wants to be there, then uh, we're going to welcome them into the building. And we're trying to come up and, and set up with our processes and procedures and protocols on how to handle that, whether it's some temperature checks, if it's doing some masks, we're looking at having some safeguards, some different things that can be sprayed that limit the growth of bacteria and viruses and uh, how we're going to clean and, and limit the number of people in elevators. So we're doing all those sorts of things um, as we're preparing to go back the uh, May 26th. And I'll be happy to, if anybody has any questions, Commissioner, if you do, I'll take a couple if, if if you yes. Don't have any. Yeah, I've got a few. So, so the major business that you're going to be doing is it going to be all budget for that two weeks? Um, I think budget would play a part in it, and but there will be legislation that will be passed. I mean, when we go back on when session starts on June 1st, I think there's 30 some bills on the House floor, and we currently have I think I haven't seen the final number, but my guess is about 200 bills in subcommittee and there's a, probably another 200 in full committee. So at this point, we're looking to take all that up and, and making decisions. Now, things that cost money is a little different. All that will go behind the budget um, and we'll just have to make those determinations if it's uh, if we have enough money to fund those types of things and what may have been funded two months ago may not be funded today. So. Would you expect some major changes to the, the budget that starts July 1st. Yes, I would anticipate. So I would anticipate um, this current budget year uh, when we reduced revenue uh, before we left the projections, uh, I think that affected the budget by a couple hundred million dollars. We're looking anywhere from, you know, 200 million, probably in excess of 500 million budget cuts for this coming that we're in for this year. The next fiscal year, it could be as high as a, a, a billion dollars that may have to be cut. So, but wow. yeah, so it's going to be it's going to be significant. What do you think the role of the rainy day fund will be through that process? 
It's a good question. You know, as we're cutting, the, there's going to be discussions about, you know, uh, recurring and non-recurring. The, the rainy day fund can help plug a hole. Um, but I was on a call with the comptroller yesterday, and you can use it to plug a hole, but you can't use it um, to do a, a big plug. So, you know, if there's certain things that we want to keep, but we think will rebound in, in a year, we can kind of use that money to plug that hole. The bond ratings look at us um, in a not so good light if we just use a rainy day fund and don't make, make recurring changes. So they can be used to a certain degree. Um, I think it, it could be used to um, also to help um, get the economy rebooted. Um, I think if you want to talk about the CARES Act, you know, we get $2.3 billion for the CARES Act. None of that can be used to plug a revenue shortfall. It has to be used for COVID-19 expenditures or expenses, so we can't even use that to, to do that. So that was a long answer to your short question. But Bailey, we'll use some of the rainy day fund to plug the holes, but there's going to be significant cuts and for reoccurring dollars. Yeah, I think I think that's to be expected that because the tax revenue is is down just like the economy is. So um, it's going to be tough, isn't it? It is. It's going to be tough. And, and what I will tell everybody to remember, and I think the, the governor has hit on it, and, and he's done a a, a fabulous job of getting us to a point to where we now have enough PPE and enough testing and we flatten the curve enough to lower the mortality rate to allow us to open up the economy and, and keep our capacities at the hospital. And I think that was the number one goal whenever he put in the restrictions in place to have us um, uh, be safe at home because of we didn't want to overrun the hospital. So I think the governor and everybody feels comfortable that we have that capability now. Uh, but as you reboot, you know, the, the, the issue is as you reboot and people have businesses, there's still people um, who don't feel safe to go out and spend their money and visit certain things. So even though businesses are open, doesn't mean that the revenue flip, the switch is going to flip right on. It's going to take a while. That's anybody's guess. It could be the end of the year. It could be the beginning of next year. So we just have to be prepared, and I think that's why. Even if we think we have to, if we're cutting too much, it's better sometimes to cut a little more, and then, but not have to go back and redo the budget in mid year. So, yeah, but you would expect even if the worst is passed and we don't have a relapse and we're able to get a vaccine and all that, it'll take two budget cycles at a minimum to get back normal. I, I think so. I mean, I think sales tax revenue. Um, you know, I think we're a little off projection, seven, eight percent, which is not not a ton. I mean, I think the April numbers were holding pretty well, um, and and so it was doing better than what I thought. You know, F and E taxes, which is our second biggest source of revenue in the state, that will be one that we'll really have to take a look at because um, the way that we have it, based on you know payroll, based on inventory, based on some other stuff. So that tax will be very interesting to watch, and if you remember back. Uh, during Governor Haslam's days when the budget revenue growth wasn't through the roof yet, we were struggling with F and E collection. Sales tax was up, everything was up, but F and E was what was lagging. And so as we come out of this, as businesses come, one is consumer spending, the other is the businesses and, how, and the, the F, F and E tax that we're collecting. So it's the, those are the two main taxes to look at. Gas tax is obviously going to be low, but that's a pay-as-you-go system. So it's not as detrimental to us if gas tax is low for a little bit because we don't incur debt and, and and we only spend what we take in. So some projects might be have to move back, but that's not as detrimental as the sales tax in F and E. Okay, are there any chat questions? Feel free to put a question in there if you have one. Uh, is is there anything that uh, we can do the ag and forestry industries to to help? Other than what we're already doing and 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 the supply chain stuff uh, to support uh, you or the legislature. Yeah, I appreciate that question. Yeah, I mean, as you know, at the governor put together a, a small group of of uh, cross section of administration and legislative um, branches, and uh, to spend the two point three million dollars in the CARES Act. So. I'm sure Butch Ely and 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 uh, and the governor will be reaching out. And so as we're wanting to go through this, I know that, you know, ag and farmers have, have 
suffered a lot and you see the dairy farmers having to just pour out milk because there's not a market there for. So, you know, for you all to give us guidance on how we can help farmers sustain and uh, be able to continue during this difficult time as we get back would be very beneficial. Um, and if there's other things we can do to help in the supply chain and, and, and help those types of businesses, because, you know, the one thing is I, I, I have been watching articles where the restaurants are closed and you see the butcher's business uh, increase because the public has started going back to the butcher and getting their cut to meat there instead of the butcher sending them to the restaurant. So, you know, anything that you think that we can do to help your department or, or the people that you help or, um, or just anything in general that, that you, you all come across that you think would be beneficial, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know. We'll be happy to kind of put that in the mix and, and see if we can not uh, get some of that stuff accomplished. Okay, well, we really appreciate you being on and, and thank you for what you're doing. It's going to be uh, a tough next couple of years and we're, we're all in this together and uh, this no. shall pass. In the bathroom with her headphones on, and I'm okay. Yeah, it will pass, and uh, you know, know, at the end of the day, you know, I'll, I'll close with this. At the end of the day, you know, all we have is hope and faith, and that you know, everybody's in a spot to to play a certain part to help our state. Whether it's someone who owns a business, someone who works for uh, your department or no department, or or people in leadership roles or whatever it may be, we all have a role to play. And so we're gonna get through this and um, and we'll be better for it and stronger. And, and you know, I'll look at back on this as a learning experience as we go forward. So I appreciate the time to be here and uh, and, and thank you all for having me. We, we do have one question. Uh, okay. It says, uh, is the unemployment trust fund in as serious of a condition as News Channel 5 is reporting? <laughs> Um, the, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so the, at, at this point, no, it could be yes. And what I'll, I'll, I'll phrase that. So the, the bulk of the money, the $600 is federal money. So that doesn't come out of the unemployment trust fund. That's just extra money. Um, mm -hmm. the unemployment trust fund had a balance of about $1.3 billion when we started this process. Now we're, uh, down to just over a billion dollars. So depending on how long uh, people stay on unemployment, how long it takes for us to reboot, um, there could be a serious problem. And and that, so yes, there could be, I'm not saying there won't be, there could be. The second problem that you have um, is you have businesses who were, uh, who closed or, or were told to close um, due to this. And so they didn't get their PPE to keep their people employed. And so their employees went to the unemployment office, which is fine, but basically uh, it, we're trying to mitigate the likelihood of businesses' unemployment tax going up through no fault of their own. Um, and so that's a, that's a serious thing that we're looking at is if we can kind of mitigate that. You don't want to add another expense onto these businesses, um, but that is a major concern of ours as we go forward is, is watching the unemployment trust fund, but then businesses being hit through no fault of their own because they're using the unemployment amounts. So it's a two prong. Okay. All right. So thanks again for being on and uh, keep up the good work and All right. may, the, may the force be with you. You're going to need it. All right. Thank you. all Thank you. all We'll see you all soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay, so we're going to move rapidly here with some uh, department updates, and we're going to start with uh, Deputy Commissioner Tom Womack. Thank you, Commissioner, and good morning, everybody. Uh, good to join you again this week. Uh, uh, as I reported last week, uh, we are making plans to resume more normal level of activity with our department services over the next few days. Our employees will be more visible in the marketplace and in the field uh, doing things such as inspections, site visits, product sampling, uh, landowner and business support services and those kind of things. And although we have really never stopped delivery of services, uh, we do plan to gear up our programs consistent with the governor's plan to reopen the uh, the economy and based on the level of activity that we see. 
Our, our staff approach to regulatory matters will be with an emphasis on supporting the supply chain and providing guidance where we can, but while also doing what we need to in order to protect uh, public health and safety. Uh, we will continue to have a limited presence in our physical offices for some period of time as state employees have been asked to continue working from home or remotely where they can, at least through May 26. However, I, I wanna emphasize that we fully intend to be available and to provide the same level of service that, uh, uh, that you would expect uh, of us. As uh, uh, Speaker Sexton noted, uh, we know state revenues are being impacted significantly and we're monitoring our department's budget as well. And as directed by the governor, we have instituted a hiring freeze and we're curbing expenditures where we can uh, to be able to close the books on the current year's budget, uh, but also to prepare for what we know is gonna be a tough uh, budget to starting July the 1st. We have a, a number of revenue generating and funding sources that we depend on here in the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we're monitor monitoring those closely and uh, we'll make adjustments as necessary uh, and, and hopefully with as little impact on delivery of services as possible. We have the right people uh, in the right positions. Uh, I think we have a healthy level of staffing in most of our programs and I think we're probably better prepared than most uh, to be nimble and to be able to adjust and continue on with our services with as little impact as possible. Um, we, we want to continue providing the level of service that you expect. And certainly as it relates to our core mission to protect uh, public health and safety and welfare. The Department of Agriculture has always had a reputation of being conservative and responsible with our physical management. Uh, that's been recognized by state leadership and that's served us well through the years. Uh, it won't be easy, uh, but I think we've positioned ourselves very well to, uh, uh, to handle what is to come. Uh, I'm proud to say that we have some of the dedicated, most dedicated and professional employees, I think, in state service. Uh, they always rise to the occasion. Uh, we've been through difficult times before, and um, we're gonna do whatever's necessary to support our farmers, uh, support our businesses, and serve the citizens of Tennessee as we need to. Uh, Commissioner Hatcher and I certainly wanna hear from you uh, if you have any questions or concerns about our services as we go forward. One thing I want to bring up that we really haven't had a chance to discuss on these calls, but something that's been going on behind the scenes that you may not be aware of. There's been a lot of, questions and concerns about the supply chain and specifically uh, excess product, uh, the potential uh, needless destruction of livestock and those kind of things. I know there's been a lot of concerns from the citizens. We've had emails and calls about this, but we've been working all along with a number of our partners, uh, TEMA, uh, the food banks, many of the businesses that you represent, uh, the Department of Education, Department of Environment and Conservation, and others, trying to help fill the gaps with uh, state feeding programs. And we've been able to have some success uh, redirecting some of the excess dairy and meat products on, on occasion in, in large measure uh, due to uh, generous donations by some of the businesses that I'm sure are represented on this call. So I, I just wanna let you know, uh, working on that issue, um, we have a team, uh, Rachel Powers in the commissioner's office, uh, Keith Harrison in the business development team. Uh, Dr. Balthaser is our emergency services coordinator with TEMA. Uh, they are all working together to uh, uh, help address that situation and, and to redirect uh, commodities uh, to, uh, to where they're needed the most. So if you have any questions about that, we wanna be a resource and try to facilitate that process. Commissioner, thank you, that's my report. Thank you, Tom. And so, uh, Corey, can you give us an update on uh, public, all things public affairs, please? Absolutely, good morning, everyone. As Tom mentioned, we continue to receive questions and concerns about the food supply. We are getting those questions from the media as well as from the general public directly to our office, through lawmakers' offices and through the governor's office. 
Um, definitely, I, I, I very carefully to all of those uh, questions that we receive. We want to make sure that we're sensitive to people's concerns because obviously, it doesn't matter what the situation is, people's concerns and worries are very real. And so we want to make sure that we acknowledge that, um, but while also responding to them in a very thoughtful um, and science-based manner. So we continue to manage that. Um, something that I'm going to be working on today and, and hope to have a, a draft produced pretty quickly, uh, we have been receiving questions about livestock shows and competitions as we progress through the spring and summer. Um, obviously, that is a significant part of our industry in many ways. Uh, I know we've got updates on the horse industry coming up here in a few minutes, but we are receiving questions about if and how livestock shows should, uh, or should continue on as planned. And so I'm going to be working with UT to develop some guidance on that coming in the, uh, for the rest of today. Um, also, one of the things that we are looking forward to is, um, you know, we, we got a lot of traction out of our strawberry season promotion and press release that we sent out. Um, you know, farmers markets are starting to gear up as well. So we're looking forward to promoting farmers markets in the coming weeks. Um, obviously, there's an added layer to that this year. We're going to really be emphasizing, which we've already been emphasizing, but we'll continue to do so, the different steps that markets are taking this year to keep customers safe. You know, when we get questions about the food supply, we are pushing people to their local farmers, their local farmers markets, and pick Tennessee products because, as we know, the food supply in Tennessee is plentiful, and we see this as an opportunity to really encourage people to take advantage more of their local farm products that are available to them. So that will be a, uh, a main primary promotion that we have in the coming weeks. And Commissioner, those are all of my updates for today. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Keith. Yes, sir. Uh, start, I always like to start out with some notes from Assistant Commissioner David Arnold, our state forester. Uh, forester industry concerns and actions are developing into three general priority areas that continue through this tough time, these tough times. Our top priority is keeping the workforce safe and available and diligence in following CDC guidelines and following lumber mill uh, mitigation plans is, is continuing. The industry will try and understand and take advantage of federal as well as state economic stimulus funds and they're pursuing to that end. And as the sectors of the domestic market continue to be depressed, they're keeping an eye on export markets and hopefully a strong recovery. But export market development remains critical, uh, particularly under the current situation and will remain so in the future. Hats off to the Tennessee Forestry Association and Candace and the forestry industry for being so proactive and collaborative in addressing the COVID-19 situation. It's very inspiring to see the industry come together uh, to encourage and support each other during during this very, very difficult time. A uh, few re realities we're, uh, we, we've seen this week when it comes to coronavirus. Uh, uh, coronavirus may prompt a migration out of American cities. Uh, nearly one third of Americans are considering moving into less densely populated areas uh, because of the coronavirus outbreak, according to a Harris poll this week. Uh, we're seeing new rules at retail. Commissioner Hatcher mentioned this earlier, but Costco employ customers, excuse me, will be required to wear masks effective Monday, April 4th. Uh, so it's very timely that our discussions on ma masks too in the, on the conference call. Do you realize that 47% of the U.S. gross domestic product comes from the service sector? Travel, restaurants, hospitality, doctors, healthcare professionals, beauticians, barbers, etc. You know, if you think about it, this sector has taken the hardest hit of social distancing. So, as restrictions on this sector is lifted, common sense says this should be a positive thing on the economic condition of our country. And something else we kind of learned this morning is that Americans are stashing away cash in banks at a rate not seen since the early 1980s. The United States Government Bureau of Economic Analysis reported this week that savings rate surged to 13% in March, up from 8% in February. Uh, good news for consumers, we continue to have the best and the safest food supply in the world. Despite COVID-19, food remains relatively reasonably priced and available. Consumers can rest assured that they're going to have food on their table. 
and a lot of that's because sustainability is a top priority for our for our farmers and that's a very very positive thing for consumers uh, some good news from farmers we've we've heard this week that chicken demand uh, in u.s fast food restaurants has bounced back uh, to uh, to where it, almost to where it was prior to the coronavirus outbreak according to pilgrim's pride uh, the recovery at fast food restaurants signals that consumers hopefully are resuming some normal activities and things will move forward and as the U.S. economy begins to come online, gasoline demand will rise with more driving, and this could help ease uh, some of the ethanol surplus I issues that we have and hopefully slow down the bleeding of that important part of our ag industry. Uh, something else, you know, for farmers, you know, farmers have the ability to pivot their operations based on the needs of the marketplace, and we're seeing more and more of them do this all the time, and that gives rise to the farm-to-table trend and it's going to continue to accelerate, which offers farmers even more opportunities. And, you know, through all this crisis, though, we've seen consumers develop an even greater appreciation for the farmer and our food supply chain. So we're hoping that that'll be a positive thing for us as we move forward. That's my report, Commissioner. Thank you, Keith. Good report. And Max, we know that you're on, sir. How are you? Good. How are you, Max? I'm good, Commissioner. Thanks for having me um, back again. How's the weather in Washington? Oh, you know, it's a little cloudy today, but uh, how's overall, the weather in Washington? Oh, it's a little cloudy today, but overall, it's good. Well, I'm happy to dive in. Okay. To, I'm happy to dive into uh, a, a quick federal update on some of the things that are happening. I think the biggest news this week was that the Centers for Disease Control and uh, and OSHA, which is an agency of the Department of Labor. Uh, released their guidance on meat processing uh, facilities, meat and poultry processing facilities. Now, there's a lot of question marks with that guidance, um, but it, it is good news. And I'm sure most folks saw President Trump's executive order, uh, which designates meat and, and poultry processing as a critical infrastructure that needs to continue. I think our processors are just trying to figure out what the best way to implement that guidance is. Um, obviously, reformulating plant layouts and, and line speeds and all that is, is a big task that they're, um, they're trying to think about. It's also raised some questions about how much, um, how much the, the federal government expects private employers to get involved in their, their employees' private lives um, because they can obviously take steps at the plant itself. Um, but outside of that, you know, it, it's unclear. Some of our processes are, are not really clear about their obligations um, when it comes to their employees outside of work and social distancing or carpooling or um, other other areas. So we're trying to work through all those details with USDA uh, and make sure that we're, we're giving our processors the best guidance. But um, it was good news. I think that that folks recognize that that was a big priority and, and important to the, uh, the overall health and safety of our nation. So um, we're, we're encouraged that that's moving forward. And I know the processors are all um, taking taking it very seriously as well. On the, um, I, I want to touch on a couple other items. Uh, the Small Business Administration programs, um, as folks know, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, we're getting reports that most of our farm credit systems are now online with that program, so that the second round uh, of, of funding has been a little easier. So hopefully that's trickled, trickled out to the countryside. A little discouraging um, that on the, the other program that SBA is running is called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, or EIDL. Uh, that program, they actually haven't been able to accept new applications because they're trying to work through a backlog from the initial uh, surge in demand. And as folks might remember, you know, agricultural producers were only included in, in eligibility for this program uh, in the second round. So we're waiting for SBA to basically clear through those old applications uh, before we can start submitting more. I haven't gotten firm details on timing and when that might happen, uh, but hopefully it's early next week. And then uh, our folks can start applying and getting some benefits from there. So I can I will keep you all posted on the timeline for that. Uh, the final thing I want to touch on was the USDA uh, aid package that's that's working its way through the system. Uh, we're expecting the draft rule from USDA on the direct payments program to head over to the White House. Um, hopefully today might be might be early next week uh, for just some review and um, looking at an, still an early May kind of release for what those direct payments will look like. We've heard a lot of concerns on, on a bunch of different items uh, related to the direct payments, all very valid. I think folks are concerned about the timeline um, and when sales might take place and how that's going to be accounted for. Uh, there's also been some concern about the payment caps and, um, and how much those might inhibit 
uh, agricultural producers. Now, obviously, when you're when you're looking at it in the media and you see a payment cap of one hundred twenty five thousand dollars per commodity, that sounds like a whole lot of money to a lot of folks, but um, they don't they don't always understand the the significant costs that the agricultural production entails. Um, so there's been a little bit of education, I think, with that um, in, in Congress and trying to trying to make folks aware of the realities of of our industry and and what agricultural production really takes. Um, but we're working on getting some of those details ironed out. As I said, we're expecting the final rule to come out early May uh, with payments starting to hit late May. So we'll keep you all posted there. But unfortunately, I don't have a ton of details um, because that rule is still under lock and key uh, between USDA and the White House. I'm happy to take any questions or um, add additional commentary if you'd like, Commissioner. Yeah, I see one here, Max. So the question is, if an employer, employer has already received the PPP money and some of the employees have filed for unemployment or, or maybe they've laid some off, but how does that work as far as is there a certain percentage they have to maintain or can you provide some insight on that? I, I will look into the details and get back to you, um, Commissioner. I know at a, at a broad level um, to get the PPP loan forgiven, 75% has to be used on payroll, uh, but I'm not sure about. But they have to maintain a certain level of employment, right? Is it 90% or something? I, yeah, I, you know, the, the, the exact number's escaping me, but um, I will I will find it and then uh, shoot it over to you all. Okay. So you but there is a that. qualifier of some sort, I'm pretty sure. It has there to be a certain percentage, okay. It's been a challenge for some folks just with the, the plus up in unemployment. Um, it's made it pretty attractive for some some employees to want to take unemployment instead. So that's kind of a line that we're trying to navigate. But I'll I'll get the exact threshold and uh, follow up with you. So anything to update on phase four? Is there going to be a phase four or phase four? Um, but the the contours of it, I'd say, are still very much in question. Uh, the Senate is is coming back next week, um, so they'll be in back in Washington. Um, and practicing social distance guidelines, but but operating in person. Um, the House is has another two week delay while they try and figure out their uh, their operations, and it's obviously a, a bigger body with a lot more staff. So they're trying to th work through that. So there, there definitely will be a phase four, um, but not not sure on timeline. And uh, I don't think it's going to happen too quickly. Um, that's the messaging we've gotten from Leader McConnell's office that they want to. They want to take their time with this next one and make sure that we're really plugging gaps instead of just rushing money out the door. Yeah. Do you think the states are going to get any money from the feds to use at their discretion? I'm hopeful. I think um, we're, we're, we're going to have to make that case pretty strongly in the next couple of weeks. And that's something that NASDA is thinking about internally, um, making sure we, we get enough support on the Hill before we make a, a big push. Okay. But yeah, there's, there's going to be some funding. Um, and what I've been telling folks too is, you know, no matter what what happens, us us advocating and explaining our needs for the states, um, I think will set us up well. So that even if yeah. block grants don't come through, um, we'll still be in a position to to make that case for why additional funding needs to be included elsewhere. Okay, so we don't know for sure whether block grants will be coming or not, do we? We do not, um, and and it's going to be a little bit of an uphill slog, I think, in Congress, just because. A lot of folks that we've talked to with initial conversations, um, they like the money going to the governor's office and and having it be central. Um, so yeah. we're trying to we're trying to explain why why agriculture departments especially can help make sure we're we're plugging gaps in rural communities. And you know, honestly, the, the SBA programs are are a pretty good indication of that. Where it's not that anybody intentionally meant to left ag leave agriculture out of the program, but just the way that it was implemented, um, we didn't really see those benefits flow to the agriculture sector in equal portions. So it does give us a good case example to tell folks why we need that dedicated funding. Yeah, but, or you it could go to the states and flag part of that for ag, potentially. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, we appreciate the update as usual, and we don't. Um, and I'm just going to throw this out to the group now where you can be thinking about it. Um, and if, if you could jump in on the chat and give your opinion uh, while we're talking here, we're thinking about going to every other week. I don't know if it's a correct time to do that or not. Things are still rapidly happening. So give us your opinion by chat or by email to Tina, uh, whether you want to slow this down to go every other week or whether you want to continue weekly and maybe by the, into the call, we'll have an answer. So I, uh, I can't tell you yet, Max, when we'll do it again, but we'd like to have you on.
Commissioner. I'm, I'm ready and uh, happy to join whenever you all are having these calls. We're already getting some feedback, so we'll, it, it may be next week if that continues, but we'll let you know. And thank you so much. Commissioner, and have a good day, everybody. Okay. So we're going to move uh, rapidly on uh, supply chain updates, and we'll start with Tennessee Farmers Co-op, the co-op, if there's a representative on, if, if Jimmy's on or somebody. Yes. Jimmy. Star six, if you're calling in. I see you there. Okay, we'll move to uh, Jennifer Houston. WebEx, Jennifer. He's not on mute. And you're not on mute. Okay. There she goes. I heard somebody. Hello? She's back on mute. I don't know. She's off no. mute now. I am not. I can I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Okay, it's been time yes. talking. Yes. Well, I did. Things. The president had a call day before yesterday with our our president, two others, and uh, talking about the ad by John Tyson. He was certainly not pleased with that ad. That I think he considered fear mongering as far as the supply chain. Not to say that we're not going to have some problems. Uh, certainly, even in the beef, maybe not to the extent of pork and chicken, although every time they talk about euthanizing, they show pens of, of beef cattle that is not mentioned anywhere. We have a little more flexibility uh, in the way our supply chain works than, than pork and chicken as far as the backups. Yes, they'll get bigger and that will create some problems, behind, but we, we do have a little more time. As far as the facilities, first of all, the Defense Protection Act that you mentioned one thing that they don't mention that was a really important part of that act is why we got involved in it is that it keeps a state and a locality from making the decision to close a plant. And that was happening or talked about being happening in several states. So it keeps that from happening. Uh, the president has sent a guard I uh, just saw this morning to help Dakota City, which is a Tyson plant that just closed down yesterday. It's going to be closed for cleaning till Monday, and the National Guard is going to help. Uh, with that, so Tyson still has Pasco and Dakota City down. Cargill, all their U.S. plants are operational. They still have one in Alberta, Canada, closed. Uh, National and uh, JBS are still all working. But the Defense Production Act will not necessarily keep the plants open um, if something happens and will not make the employees come to work. So uh, we were pleased to see the CDC guidelines, and most all of them have been working towards those uh, social distancing measures as far as the temps and everything else for several weeks now. Um, one thing that's good is exports are up. And although you see social media and they say, oh, that means less for the U.S. consumer, let's remember that for beef particularly, what we export is not usually what we eat here in the U.S. So uh, that just keep, keeps continuing to get that whole carcass utilization uh, so that we don't get backed up with things and, and have to send more to win rendering than we are now. So again, we have plenty of supply. Will we have some supply disruptions that you'll see in the grocery store? Sure, over the next few weeks, because a lot of the plants that are operating are operating at about 50% or less capacity. So that's going to naturally slow things down. Uh, it will adjust over time if, if we don't have just massive uh, or even more massive outbreaks than we've had now. So things, um, they're not good, but they could be worse. We continue to work, like Max talked about, with a couple of things on the um, on the CARES Act, as far as particularly the payment limitations and um, the arbitrary dates that, that have been floated around. Again, he's right, it's very secretive, but from what they tell us, um, hopefully we can get some of those things worked out that will really help our cattle producers. So that is my report, Commissioner. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Phyllis Ferguson, I think you're on as well. Yes, good morning. 
thank you for your comments with regard to the uh, processing industry. <laughs> And I would just add, Jimmy Tosh did a great job yesterday on a webinar hosted by Farm Journal, uh, just detailing some of what the industry, along with producers, a dairy producer, a vegetable producer, had to say. And it's just important to get the word out to consumers that, for example, the vegetable producer, a gentleman from Florida, you know, folks want to come and help them. However, Many flats of onions, that's not what just, you know, one consumer can use at home. So, you know, just getting the word out as to what the size of our agriculture operations are dealing with is important. And thanks for continuing the call for, I think we're all saying a couple more weeks uh, as things are so fluid. Um, appreciate it. Thanks, Phyllis. I know Dale's not on, I don't believe. Uh, Stan Bud, are you on? Remember star six, if you're calling you in. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, it looks like from a larger processor standpoint that there will be some uh, finalized uh, determinations for the Dean's bankruptcy issue and the DFA uh, assuming uh, control. That's supposed to be announced uh, finally on Monday from the bankruptcy judge uh, there is very little uh, concern as far as supply uh, and our processors are, are running full speed and, and I think uh, from a dairy standpoint uh, we're in good shape as far as fluid milk uh, butter is good the concern is uh, from across the nation the effect that the closure of restaurants and, and industrial accounts and schools has uh, had on the on the futures market that's depressed the price uh, for milk considerably. Uh, we are seeing renewed interest in our small processors. Uh, I can tell you that Weigel, who is a smaller processor over in East Tennessee, sales have been really strong. Uh, for the first two or three weeks, our sales were up 20 to 30 percent. I talked with Mr. Bill earlier in the week. Their sales are continuing to to show a seven to eight percent uh, increase. So people are being able to buy uh, dairy products and, and milk uh, without much interruption at this point. Uh, another concern is uh, our slaughter facilities. Would it be inappropriate, Commissioner, to ask uh, where we might be as far as uh, our uh, meetings that we've had even before COVID hit as far as consideration for a packing plant uh, in a strategic location in the state. I know I got a call from a senator earlier in the week. I got a call from uh, two or three other people asking about uh, uh, kill dates. Uh, I was at a sale on Monday uh, Richard Brown, who is <coughs> over TLP, said he called five, uh, five uh, for, uh, processors and he couldn't get a date until the 1st of November. Uh, and <coughs> I talked with Dr. Strick. I think he has sent you uh, their uh, findings from their, uh, from their survey. Is that correct? Maybe several weeks past. Several weeks past. So because of all of the COVID, has that kind of been put on the back burner or because of the renewed interest, uh, uh, maybe we need to uh, address that as well. Uh, I know there's, there's, very, there's, there's one person up in the Dandridge area that's really wanting to get something done. Uh, Dr. Frick says, it would be ideal if we can encourage uh, uh, eight to 10 smaller processors uh, that could kill 30 to 50 head, uh, including uh, sheep and goats. So uh, that would help from a food chain standpoint as far as the big retailers. Then, uh, you know, I check the supermarkets regularly and, and 
beef supplies are adequate, you know, maybe not what they were. Chuck rolls seem to be on short supply for whatever reason. Uh, Send him text to Bob Iker, CPA. But I think Jennifer addressed that. I'd had a good conversation with Jennifer earlier in the week, so uh, I appreciated that. So uh, from a dairy standpoint, that's my report. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll know from the stimulus money how that our dairy producers are going to receive it. Uh, but I think as what Max reported, uh, they really opened up Pandora's box when they started putting restrictions on it and having to rethink it. So I think that's where we are. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Stan. Uh, Candace, are you available? Rob says he can talk for a minute. Hey, good morning. This is Candace at Tennessee Forestry Association. I appreciate the time, Commissioner, and, and other folks on the call as well. And I appreciate um, Speaker Sexton sharing some thoughts earlier in the call. I thought that was very valuable. I would just say that um, as far as TFA is concerned, it's uh, a big hit we took this week when the Dom Tar mill up in Kingsport, the paper mill up there closed down for at least through June. We don't really know the future of what will happen with the mill up there. Um, Dom Tar employs over 300 people up at Kingsport and makes copy paper. You knew there was a little decline in sales of copy paper before uh, the, the virus. Uh, <laughs> Pandemic, but obviously with schools, uh, businesses, uh, universities uh, shut down, that also uh, affected the sale of copy paper. So uh, again, we were concerned about the future of the Dom Tart Mill. Uh, the paper was made out of wood chips, so the wood chips were purchased from the sawmills up in East Tennessee. So the sawmills no longer have that opportunity to sell their wood chips to Dom Tar, so they're looking for different markets. Uh, Obviously, everyone hopes that the mail opens back up at the end of June, 1st July, but we just don't know. And and just a triple down effect certainly affects the forest landowners up in that part of the state because there won't be the market for the for the wood chips and uh, eventually affect the uh, making the paper, which was uh, the big market for the sawmills up in that part of the world. Uh, again, thanks for what you do, and these calls have been very valuable to me, and uh, appreciate everyone's time. Thanks. Thank you, Candace. Uh, Rob, you've got a quick update. Uh, yes, sir, Commissioner. Thanks for the opportunity to give you the perspective from the uh, grocery, wholesale, and retail side of the food industry. Uh, obviously, the uh, indefinite shutdowns of beef and pork facilities uh, is concerning, uh, and we think that uh, could get uh, uh, worse at uh, retail because of that. The challenge for retailers is the balance of pricing to make uh, the needed margin and the public perception that retailers might be price gouging. Uh, warehouses today are actually a little heavy on meat due to increased orders and the building of inventory over recent weeks. The question of restaurants opening up affects grocery supply uh, uh, indeed, particularly in proteins. Uh, the good news for grocery is that restaurants are only opening at ha half capacity. And of course, there's a, a bright side uh, for grocery with restaurants opening up and that, that takes a little pressure uh, off of them for food supply. Uh, we still have a huge number of items on allocation and we'll be getting uh, things on allocation for quite some time. Paper products are improving. Big box retailers seem to be getting their full share versus the fair share that independent retailers are getting. Uh, we continue to ship at historic levels, consistently at 130% above normal levels and spiking at 140%. Uh, recruiting and retention are ongoing issues for the uh, wholesale and retail uh, side of things. We've offered additional incentives for production uh, workers to keep them engaged. Uh, that's my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. It, it looks like most want to have a uh, a call at least the next two weeks and and to jennifer houston's point to see the effect of the reopening uh so in in addition to that keith uh harrison remind me uh, if we can add somebody in to give the uh restaurant perspective see how that's going next week that'll be it's gonna be interesting isn't it rob to see what happens or what doesn't happen yeah it'll be interesting one way or another yeah. 
be glad okay. to do that. All right, so we, we, we didn't want to leave out the equine industry. I know that they've been deeply affected too. Valerie has a question for Rob about the limited oh, purchase. Oh, uh, Val, there is a question, Rob, for you. Um, do you think retailers will limit purchase of meat sales? I think that uh, that limitations will come in in the form of possible shortages and price adjustments, and 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 to the extent that the law allows, I think retailers will. Need to adjust their prices to to moderate uh, panic buying. Okay. Um, let's see. So I was saying that we didn't want to leave out the equine industry. So I know they're deeply affected as well. So we wanted uh, Jennifer Ivy to give an update on the equine industry. Hi everyone, and thanks, Commissioner, for having us in here and um, considering the equine industry as well. We really appreciate it. Um, and so, we are really active in trying to determine how the economic recession um, that we know is coming and that's already currently happening will impact the equine industry. Um, comparing it to the 2008 recession, we know that we're likely going to be expecting a lot more um, horses entering the sale ring. And then also likely a lot of those um, entering into some welfare concerns with regard to um, starvation and neglect, just due to the fact that maybe they can't move those horses and that also um, people may not be able to feed them at this time. So um, I sit on the equine extension um, board across the country. And so a lot of the statewide specialists are trying to determine ways to help share information about potential outlets um, to help horses either be rehomed or educate people about maybe some lower cost options to continue feeding their animals, um, hopefully to help reduce those numbers across the board. Um, just thinking back to you know 2008 when we saw a lot of the, the spike, um, it was estimated then that about 170,000 horses go unwanted within the United States each year. And so um, it's something that I think we're definitely looking um, to see maybe an increased number of that across the country. Um, with regard to specific numbers within Tennessee, we don't necessarily have those. Um, we are working towards developing a survey to assess the biggest need that our equine owners have. Um, and along with that, the business operators that are also affected um, by the shutdown currently. Um, with regard to potentials on the show arenas that was mentioned earlier in the call, um, a lot of the facilities are have canceled or at least postponed or put on hold some of their um, events. But they're, they have been reaching out and asking about what they can do from a facility sanitation perspective, um, not only to, to help biosecurity um, across the board, just from a longevity perspective, but also to help keep people safe as they move forward. So, um, again, that same extension horses group put out a series of webinars over the last three weeks, um, one of which was on facility sanitation um, and disinfecting. Um, non traditional services. So things like tack and equipment, um, wood surfaces, I mean, maybe some other areas that are heavily um, trafficked by people within a barn or a show situation. And so um, I've shared some of that with Dr. Beatty and then also some of the um, information um, infographic type uh, publications that we have and more will be coming forward. Um, and just as another quick, you know, kind of aside with the equine industry overall, there's been a lot of question about um, whether the equine industry um, care is considered essential and non-essential. And at what point do we stop um, maybe riding lessons or maybe group um, activities as opposed to what the animal actually needs from day to day care. So um, from the extension side, we've been fielding a lot of questions with regard to how facilities um, maybe could operate on those or how to help them stagger their schedules. So um, happy to continue sharing that information um, and be able to move forward from there. Um, that's all I specifically have, but if I can answer any other questions, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, let's see, it's uh, Rory Williams. Yes, sir. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. And good morning to everyone else on the call this morning. Let me say first, God bless you all today and every day. The, uh, the bottom line up front is that the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Association and the official registry of our state horse has certainly felt the sting of an economic downturn from the virus. Um, now, in the past few years, there have been small increases in mares bred registrations and transfers, 
obviously nothing like the glory days of the 90s, but increases nonetheless. Um, however, at present, the association is negative year over year for the number of first time full registrations, ownership transfers, leases for exhibition purposes, show affiliations, uh, and overall memberships that normally renew each year with business to conduct. Um, we're seeing a decrease of four and a half percent in transfers and three and a half percent downturn in registrations uh, year over year. And we, we think that that is uh, indicative of the effects of the virus on the economy. And not to get into association finances, but we're making a great many concessions to customers that do want to conduct business to reduce costs to the public in order to support our base while they're also hurting from economic struggles. Um, additionally, our online business conduct is, is increasing and we think it will continue to grow as people have very quickly become more accustomed to communicating via email than in the recent past. Now, as an association, we're making more directly on our forms, as well as continuing to host online membership, full registration, stallion breeding reports, and futurity nominations. And for the first time since 1962, our breed journal that publishes a bi-monthly has been issued digitally versus in print due to the increased rev decreased revenue and high, high cost of publishing a print magazine. The support for the journal has been fantastic from our advertisers supporting the industry and the breed registry. With that, we're hopeful for the future and that as much as the sequestration bores people, it also gets them back on their horses and doing some personal registry house cleaning to keep the pedigrees correct for the long-term benefit. As far as horse shows are concerned, we're, we're thinking positive that even with a late start, we can have a good year of fellowship and revenue exhibiting the, uh, the great breed that is our state horse. As Tennessee is coming back alive with the governor's plan, our offices in Lewisburg reopened to the public Monday, uh, May 4th with necessary precautions to keep both our customers and staff protected from personal exposure to one another while accomplishing our required business. Um, pending any questions from the forum or from you, Mr. Commissioner, that is all we have from TWHBEA. Thank you, Rory, for joining us. Let's see. Uh, I know Misty can't be on, so Carol, can you give uh, make whatever comments you want to make? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Misty was sending her apologies for not being able to make the call today. She she really hated that she, something came up, but she reported to me that concerns are growing nationally around the mental health and well-being of farmers and first responders. Misty will be speaking with. Forbes magazine today regarding farmers' mental health and suicide. And the Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network continues to offer virtual QPR suicide prevention trainings. And these are free and they last between an hour or to two hours. So if anyone has any questions about obtaining those trainings, you can contact me or Misty. That's all she had. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. And Jeff and Radonna, how are you guys doing today? Okay. Jeff? Barely. Barely. We don't see you. Can you hear us now? Yes. So, happy birthday, Steph and Moffin. Thank you. Did you want to sing to him, Commissioner? <laughs> well, no, not really. <laughs> Sorry, we uh, have experienced a little technical difficulty here this morning, but uh, thank you for... Uh, the call and for allowing us to be a part of it. Uh, we'd like to share just a uh, little positive news in the, in the realm of uh, everything that's going on. Uh, first off, and may still a little thunder from uh, UT Extension here, but uh, congratulations to Jay Jurgen uh, from Weekly County for being uh, 
selected as the 2022 Sea Farmer of the Year for Tennessee, and he'll be representing our state uh, at Sun Belt Expo. So, uh, congratulations to Jay and his family. Secondly, uh, Marissa Phelps, who uh, uh, most of the folks at the department for sure would know. Uh, she served an internship there. Uh, she's participating uh, today in the uh, American Farm Bureau discussion meet uh, virtually, and uh, she has made it all the way to the final four, which is which is quite an accomplishment. Uh, and that uh, competition will conclude today at 1 p.m. For those that uh, might have an interest, you can uh, watch it on the uh, American Young Farmers and Ranchers Facebook uh, live at, at one o'clock. And there will be an opportunity for the audience to vote. So we, we would certainly encourage all Tennesseans to support uh, Marissa in, in that endeavor. I would uh, echo Phyllis's uh, comments uh, in congratulating and, and thanking Jimmy Tosh for doing such a great job yesterday representing Tennessee and, and the agriculture industry in the Farm Journal webinar. Uh, also share with the group that uh, Farm Bureau and, and the Tennessee Chamber are going to be co-hosting a webinar event on Tuesday, May the 5th uh, from 8 to 9.30 on Zoom. And the focus is going to be on ag and rural economic impacts uh, due to COVID-19. Registration is limited and required, but we do think it'll be a good program with uh, Dr. Bill Fox from UT sharing the economic impact, with John Newton, an economist with the American Farm Bureau Federation, David Connor, uh, talking about the impact to local governments, and there'll be a state leader panel. Uh, we will put a link uh, on our website for those that would be interested in Participating, you can go there and register. The final thing, uh, we, we understand uh, why we've had to have some cancellations, um, some events that are very important to youth in this state, uh, one being the, the Tennessee Tech and Tennessee Farm Bureau Leadership Summit and uh, UT Martin Governor's School going to a uh, uh, virtual program, I think. Uh, I was just wondering if anybody on the call could uh, perhaps share with us uh, um, any updates on, on plans for either of those events. And that would conclude our report. Commissioner, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Let's see, let's go to USDA next and uh, we can start with Mike if Mike's on. I think you're on WebEx. Good morning. I'm good, how are you? Uh, I'm able to actually talk through the WebEx this morning, so that we got that solved. Um, this morning, uh, my report uh, is going to be somewhat about our operational status. Uh, we're, we are continuing um, under the current status that we uh, have been under. Uh, however, we are expecting changes to be provided with us next week to liberalize our ability to operate in specific communities. Um, those communities, of course, will be those that can meet the definitions uh, of lower infectivity and trending down, which will be a large percentage of our rural communities. So we're looking forward to see what those changes are going to be. We've been cautioned that uh, we're not going to be able to flip the switch completely open, but we will be dialing it up. So uh, hopefully uh, next week, I'll be able to report more about what that's gonna look like uh, as we begin to get into the really the crunch time for us as far as gathering acreage information and crops getting in the ground timely and the reporting that sur uh, surrounds that particular event. Uh, I guess for additional thing that Max has already um, alluded to is the fact that we are in the rules writing process uh, for the CFAP. Uh, we do expect that we are on the same timeline as far as implementation. They're still telling us to be expecting to start that process sometime late this month. So we are trying to gear ourselves up uh, in preparation for doing that. Um, 
we will um, um, be trying to get those completed sometime in the month of June. So uh, we, we, we do have those coming up in front of us. So we've got a lot of work to do in preparation to get those completed. Uh, that's really all that I have of my report today, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, and I'll uh, take any questions that might be out there. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and it uh, looks like uh, Sheldon's on WebEx as well. You there, Sheldon? Oh. You're not muted, I don't believe. It must be on your end. Okay, we'll try Jim Tracy. Call in, maybe. Can you hear me okay, Commissioner Hatcher? Yes. yes. Okay. So, all right. Sorry about that, sir. But uh, no changes to our operation status. We're still waiting on uh, guidance from Washington, D.C. Our, our field staff right now um, is processing about 3,500 environmental quality incentive program applications where we're completing assessments, uh, rankings, and also completing inventory and valuation in the field. Um, our conservation stewardship program sign up is underway. Uh, it ends on May 29th. Uh, we roughly have over 500 applications for that program. Our numbers are up and we're seeing inc increased participation. Um, right now we're working with about 32 sponsors as far as the emergency watershed protection program from the recent storm events we had here in Tennessee. And we're also completing uh, damage survey reports and submitting requests to uh, headquarters for funding there. Um, employees are doing field work um, with social distancing there, Commissioner, and also we're rotating staff, rotating staff in the service centers, and also we still have some staff that are doing telework. So uh, we'll continue to update you as we get information from our national office. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and appreciate being a part of this call. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, Jim, are you on, Jim Tracy? Yeah, I'm on, okay. and uh, I really don't have any changes, Commissioner. We're still operating uh, like we've been operating. We may, as Mike says, we may have new rules coming up next week, but we're still moving forward trying to process all the loans and grants we can as we uh, go through this COVID-19. So that's, a, that's my report for this week. Yeah, when are you gonna master the WebEx? Well, I was on it for a little while this morning, so, uh, you know, I figured I'd scare people in my picture, so I didn't want to stay on there long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, UT Extension, Mike, I understand you're on, and you are on WebEx. Yes, sir, I'm on WebEx. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. <clears throat> I started working as starting out helping him with his dad, and now he runs a very outstanding farming operation. And I know he'll represent Tennessee well in the Sunbelt Ag Expo Farmer of the Year program. Just a couple quick updates. Um, UT Extension has been asked to assist in the distribution of masks that the state is shipping out to all the county health departments. Our regional directors have met and have submitted a draft plan for the distribution of these masks. And we are waiting this time for further guidance from the state on, on when and how to distribute these masks. Uh, we heard a little bit earlier about uh, county fairs and livestock breed associations. We too have been receiving questions about, you know, regarding tagging of livestock show animals. You know, our extension agents are permitted to make farm visits uh, to witness the tagging of, of livestock show animals as long as they adhere to the CDC guidelines, such as social distancing, you know, proper hand washing, et cetera. So, we're moving forward. I know that the senior vice president and senior vice chancellor, Dr. Cross, has appointed a committee to develop a plan for reopening the Institute of Agriculture. I know this committee has been actively working on developing this plan, and as soon as it's finalized, we will be able to share that. So that's a, pretty much a quick update from UT Extension, Commissioner. Hey, Mike, while I'm thinking about it, and this is for the question for the group, uh, Mark Ezell asked me yesterday, does the ag and forestry industry businesses, do they have an interest in any of the, the 
cloth face coverings that the uh, that Tennessee is going to purchase that it's going to be distributed by you guys? I think the answer is yes, but I just want to make sure uh, there's a need for that amongst the industry. Yeah, there's still some. Uh... We're still waiting from some guidance. And I know there's going to be a distribution. I've heard of what 5 million masks uh, and multiple entities are going to be helping distribute those masks. So uh, we'll, we'll see as plans develop. And, and again, we're very pleased to be able to help to, to distribute these masks. Yeah. If anybody could chat in there and say whether they would, uh, would like to have access to cloth uh, face covering, just let us know or let Tina know so I can respond to, to Mark about that question. I think the answer is yes, especially since the county extension offices are going to be distributing and, and as well as uh, local county health departments is my understanding. But it's it, they only, I think they have about 400,000 to start with and hopefully they'll get a million a week and eventually hit that 5 million point. So um, they're, they're reusable and washable. And so they should be fairly, fairly effective. All right. So, uh, Aaron Smith. Thank you, Commissioner. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Just a, a quick up, uh, economic update. We had initial employment claims filed or unemployment claims filed in Tennessee for the week ended April 25th or 43,000 down about 24,000 from the previous week. Currently about 425,000 people are expected to be on unemployment in Tennessee or about one out of eight people in the labor pool. In terms of agriculture commodities, we had uh, US export sales and shipments were very strong the past week, triggering a rally in, in crops and livestock on Thursday and Friday. Increased buying for China was evident for both soybeans and cotton, which affects Tennessee producers directly, providing cautious optimism. In terms of weekly futures prices, uh, feeder cattle 126 to 132 up two to five compared to the previous week dairy 12 to 16 up a half to one cent hogs 58 to 63 up four to nine cotton 56 to 59 up one to two cents for the week soybeans 844 to 852 up about 10 cents for the week corn 316 to 334 so flat to slightly down compared to last week uh, prices are hopefully starting to stabilize or bottom uh, less volatility in futures has been evident in the past week. A return to functional price discovery in agriculture futures markets would assist producers in using markets as an effective risk management tool. From a policy standpoint, 2019 ARC and PLC payments to Tennessee crop producers, which will be received in October 2020, are projected to be 90 to $125 million at current marketing year prices. Payments will be substantially higher in traditional cotton counties, but an average across all base acres is projected at $29 to $40 per acre. The Food Purchase and Redistribution Program under CFAP uh, has the distributor's applications for the RFP solicitation due today. When available, it would be beneficial to have a list of all approved contracts for Tennessee and adjacent state distributors so that we can pass along that information to uh, agriculture producers in the state. Lastly, we are anxiously await details on the $16 billion in CFAP direct payments to livestock, specialty crop, and row crop producers from USDA. Those uh, that are producers or work closely with producers are strongly encouraged to get inventory numbers and sales data for all commodities on the farm organized from the period of January 1st to present so they can quickly act on the CFAP direct payments program as I fear the $16 billion will be insufficient to cover eligible losses. That is my update. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Tim, Farm Credit, are you on? Yes, I see you. I am, Commissioner, and good morning to you and to everyone else on the call. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, good. i uh, give you a little bit of an update and follow up on what Max uh, was talking about earlier in that uh, most farm credits have been approved for the uh, triple P uh, loan process on this second uh, uh, group of loans that's available. I have received an email late Wednesday evening from uh, Lisa uh, uh, Denson, who's the SBA representative for Tennessee. She gave us an update and as of then, uh, a little less than $100 billion of SBA triple P loans had been uh, spoken for 
of our financial institutions across uh, the United States. Uh, I don't know if everyone's aware, but there was a pacing initiative that was implemented by SBA so that no one financial institution could dominate the applications. Um, so in doing so, it's been more widespread. Uh, she gave me some numbers late Wednesday that said that small banks, out of the uh, little less than 100 billion that had been spoken for, small banks had about 43 billion of that, mid-sized banks had about 20 billion, and large banks had 20, 25 billion of that. And so we know there's about 310 billion set, set, set aside for this program. And so a little less than 100 late Wednesday. And of course, we'll see how that goes going forward. The activity has been very brisk uh, for us as we've been uh, taking applications and proving. I know that our commercial banks across Tennessee and across America have to, as you see from those numbers out there, and we'll see how it goes so far. Uh, there is going to be a lot of work on these loans, not only getting them approved and getting the money dispersed, but about eight weeks from now, a little longer, people are going to be making an application to have these loans forgiven, or some percent of them forgiven. And it's our understanding that you've got to spend this money in the next eight weeks, and that's the way it's written out there. So uh, there are some challenges with that. You think about that. If I'm a restaurant and I happen to receive this PPP loan two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I was closed, how do I spend that when I don't have employees? So they're working through that. I've got some friends in the restaurant business that brought employees in and they were doing some work in the, in the restaurant, painting, some things like that. Also, I think um, someone mentioned too, we've got people in our economy that's on unemployment. And so when do you bring those people back in and, and do all that? Um, the guidelines talk about, and, and they do change a little bit that they, you've got to spend 75% of this, these funds in this eight week period on payroll. And you've got to get your payroll up to that 75% level. And I was also told by an accountant that, that some of the detail is, is that you've got to have full-time employee numbers FTE uh, numbers that equal the 75% in there too. So there's some things to work through, some more learning, and the work will uh, actually uh, become greater in about eight, 10 weeks when people apply for this. One good thing, you know, is that if you don't apply, you don't get all of this forgiven, you could get a portion of it forgiven, and the remaining loan is at 1% uh, on a two-year term out there. Little update from Farm Credit. We continue our skeleton crews. People are being served. Farmers have the money uh, from us and from commercial banks to get crops planted, uh, to operate their businesses. Uh, that's going better than you would think, uh, given our circumstances. And so at Farm Credit, we're gonna be a little slow about opening our doors and moving out and uh, having our employees maybe at some risk because things are going so well the way we're operating. And so we're gonna continue to do that. We've also offered our customers a 24 hour, seven day a week LifeWorks resource program uh, to, uh, to help people like Carol was talking about earlier that's having life and financial stress out there and give them some resources on that. So hopefully things will continue to progress, Commissioner, and uh, we'll continue to uh, use these, these funds to help our businesses in Tennessee and across the United States. So thank you for allowing us to be a part of this call and for having this call. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tim. And I think uh, Pete Nelson has got a quick update on the Ag Launch, what's happening there. Pete? Yeah, this will be really quick, Commissioner. Can you hear me okay? I'm on a iPhone in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Oh, this will be really quick. First, I did want to thank you as I did on the email yesterday. I think that uh, your science background and local food background makes you the perfect person to help lead us through what we're dealing with right now. So I say that um, with, with a lot of Thanksgiving, I'm sure everybody on the call feels that. Um, I think everybody knows we are continuing to work from home following what TDA and UT are recommending uh, into May. Uh, we are executing field trials. We'll get into those in just a minute. Uh, we do, and this was kind of been touched on by uh, Corinne's uh, comments and Keith's and others, um, but, but we fundamentally believe this is a great opportunity for Tennessee, despite the short-term pain 
and really creating sort of a vision for how we position our state uh, in reaction to these new realities we touched on. So in specific, we think there are two areas. One is um, we know any of us that have heard the folks like uh, you know Rod with Ernest and Young and others talk about the big trends in agriculture. We know this connection between consumers and um, and farmers is getting smaller with less middlemen. We knew that was already a trend that's going on nationally. That's only going to be accelerated. And we think the fact that we, you know, are not in Iowa with corn, soybeans, and pork is the number ones with huge amounts of processing in place, that we have the opportunity to be more nimble. That positions us nicely to do that. Uh, we also think the obvious one that input efficiencies need to even be more prioritized, whether that's labor, uh, chemicals, fertilizer, anything else. So. The good news is we already proactively over the last four years with the support from TDA have been investing in technologies from around the world that have been tested here in Tennessee specifically to address those two issues. So that really um, is being accelerated and that's really good. So this year we've got 19 farmers engaged in trials with 16 companies. Those are 22 trials. We have a full safety plan we put in place that was reviewed by TSU and UT, um, as well as TDA, in terms of how we're deploying those trials um, as we bring, um, you know, try to do more virtual, but actually, you know, get the technologies in the hands of the farmers. Uh, that's with 16 companies. And again, these are companies like, um, you know, the first company to get FAA approval to spray agriculture chemicals, spot spray from a drone, uh, thereby dramatically increasing uh, the efficiency of the applications and lowering the energy cost. So that would be an example. Another example would be, uh, you know, Swine Tech that's working with Tosh Farms. And so we've got 16 really good technologies being invested in here in Tennessee. Tennessee farmers own equity in those companies. And again, those companies are helping reposition us for some of these new realities. So 22 trials. Uh, we also have this approach that we're doing around value-added agriculture and direct marketing that we're building, as well as some new tools that, that had been in the pipeline for a while that are now being fast, uh, you know, sped up. So one of those would be an example is really doing what we already do at the farmer's market, but spreading that out and expanding that um, with more blockchain and distributed ledger. So we have a $2 million funding from Foundation for Food and Ag Research to build a better way of connecting uh, the farmer and the end user in a way that kind of scales um, based on some of the trends. Uh, we also have seven model farms now operational. So these range from, you know, a vineyard in East Tennessee to a row crop farm in West Tennessee that are demonstrating best practices in conservation, value added agriculture, and adoption of technology. And we're using that as a base to push these things forward and bring more farmers around answering these big questions. You know, everybody on this call is giving a lot of technical support on how farmers adjust in the near term, new piece of equipment, keep cash flow going, look at different markets. We're trying to kind of create a visual place to show what does the farm of the future look like and how do we help Tennessee farmers be the best ones at doing that. So, um, and then all of our other sort of entrepreneurship programs we're doing uh, virtually and we'll be doing that into the fall. Um, and we think that actually is gonna be a way that we can increase, especially with students across the state, more young entrepreneurs pulled into the network and grown. So uh, thank you for the opportunity for the report. We are uh, sharing everybody's view of this short-term pain, but also see that there's some really interesting, good long-term opportunities for Tennessee farmers that we're uh, committed to. And if anybody needs any additional information, um, I think you guys know Jade has been doing some uh, webinars with some of the farm groups on how to interact with SBA but also other organizations like Commerce and some of the new stuff from USDA. So any way we can help any of you all um, or your farmers work through this. And I did want to add to what Mr. Aiken said, um, Jay Yergin, also Jimmy Tosh, they're members of the Ag Lunch Farmer Network. They're running these trials. So, you know, we've got really good farmers in the state. If there are others that need to be plugged in with us, please let us know. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity, Commissioner. Thanks, Pete. And we're about out of time, but Tom, if you can go quick, I understand you've got some comments. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, on behalf of Tennessee's pulp and paper industry, to supplement what Candace Dinwiddie said from the Forestry Association, uh, we just want to make everybody aware that we're still alive. We're buying all the logs and chips and sawdust and other products that people are making available to us. At the same time, the 7,500-odd employees 
of the pulp and paper industry in Tennessee are turning out tissue, paper towels, bathroom tissue, and the boxes that those products are shipped in. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Tom. So um, we are out of time, but I wanted to talk about, it looks like the general consensus is to have these calls at least a couple more weeks to see how the, the restart of the economy goes. And also the governor has promised that he will uh, be on next week. So um, we want to try to 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 tighten up this uh, the agenda a little bit. So Tom Womack may be contacting some of you and see what we can do to condense some of the updates because I want to give the governor time to to make some comments and also for some questions. So if you have specific questions for the governor you want him to address next week, email Tina or if you have specific issues that you want to have uh, to be addressed by those on the call also send those to tina so we can try to get uh tighten it up and get it as efficient as we can for next week so and all we would all we're probably going to try to invite also somebody from the hospitality industry to see what what their take is on what the reopening has done for them or not done for them and and so we look forward to that as well so until next week um Good to see everybody and uh, hope to be on the call with you next week. Thank you.